the corner of your eye, huddled in the darkest shadows of imagination, it waits. Now is the time to face the fear. Welcome to Horror Lasagna. Embrace the trepidation. We ready to get started on our next grand adventure movie? Sure thing. All right, so we're we're up to episode five, the innocence. Yeah, how time uh, flies. Yeah, how it does. Uh, and be, I mean, before we even go anywhere with this one, out of everything we watch, this one's probably the most accessible. I mean, I got a copy that was in the Criterion Collection. Yes, it is. Um, it's. You find that a lot of times with older movies, especially the ones that are really well made, you can find copies of them kicking around here and there. Um, And The Innocence, you know, hits that. Yeah. So uh, why was it in black and white? Uh, Because it was filmed in 1961. Okay. And um, the director uh, for The Innocence, Jack Clayton, really likes working with contrast in his photography. Um, and you get a lot of contrast with uh, black and white films. Got it. I mean, they could have done it in color. 61, they had color film. It's oh. true. I sometimes wonder, um, it was shot in CinemaScope, which was kind of a new format for right. film because it's such wide format. And they definitely took advantage of that. There are a couple shots in here I noticed were very artsy, you might yes. say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and he didn't want to do it in CinemaScope. But um, who is it? MGM, I think. Oh, I 20th think. Century Fox. 20th Century, okay. Said, you will do this in CinemaScope. And uh, so he went uh, to his uh, cinematographer, um, Freddie Francis, and said, do you think this can be done? And he's like, yeah, we can work with this. That's cool. So... It had a definite Alfred Hitchcock cock vibe throughout the whole thing. It uh, did. Um, this was after Hitchcock had left England, which uh, people like to point out, especially if you happen to be British, was that Hitchcock had been the king of you know suspense and fear and drama and cinema, and then he moved to California and went on to do you know great things like The Birds and things like that. A few good movies. Yeah, a few good movies, but then. Uh, Shortly gonna, thereafter, Clayton came out with this. So uh, I was going to say real quick before we delve into the movie a little more, quick trivia for Hitchcock. The whole psycho scene in the shower with it. Yeah. He didn't want any music there. The the There's a great history I listened to about the guy that did the composition for that and how he really brought a lot of what we still do music-wise in movies. Because originally – the studios did not want to put music under important scenes because it would distract people because they yeah. were still used to the silence and Hitchcock did not want any music there. And the guy said, well, I, I put something there. If you don't like it, we'll take it out. And Hitchcock's like, I was wrong. Leave it in. And it's classic. So I was just thinking about this um, because I was uh, watching the movie we'll be talking about next time. <clears throat> and there's like, uh, a scene with a radio, right? That's playing and it's kind of shot. It's not found footage, but it's shot in a found footage kind of format right. where it's all supposed to be happening live. And so uh, they're very sparse with their use of music. And I recently watched a very bad found footage movie, very bad found footage movie. And um, I always hate it when they have this found footage film. And then all of a sudden they get to this one spot, they want to build tension and they'll put music in it. And it's like, this is just some guy walking around with a camera. Where'd the orchestra come from? <laughs> it's not that found. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's an old classic co- uh, Calvin and Hobbes where uh, he's walking around and he's uh, playing music because he wants a soundtrack with his life. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a theme so much better done. with the soundtrack. Yeah. All right. All right. So tell us about The Innocence. Tell us about this movie that we recommend for everybody to go watch. Yeah, The Innocence. It um, came out in 1961. It falls into the uh, 
my, you know, I have my own categories for horror. This falls into the category of literary horror movies. And these are movies that as you watch them, they feel more like you're reading a book than you're watching a movie. Yeah. Which is funny because it is based on a book. <laughs> it is based on a book. It's based on Henry James's book, uh, The Innocence. It was kind of a novella. Um, I had read it in high school to do a paper on it. Um, and Turn of the Screw. Yes, The Turn of the Screw. It came out in a in a two part book that had the turn of the screw and Daisy Miller in it. That's you know because they were both kind of shorter stories. Right. Yeah. Um, when Henry James wrote the story, it was just received as your typical gothic ghost story. Yeah, I was gonna say it's got a very gothic feel the way they filmed this one. Yeah, and as time went on, um, Freudians and other psychoanalysts got a hold of it, and they're like, "Yeah, this isn't a ghost story. This is a story about somebody losing their mind." Yeah. Um. And so there was a guy named William Archibald who took the turn of the screw and turned it into a screen, uh, turned it into a play, and he based it on how it was originally received. It was just a ghost story. Ghost story. And when uh, Jack Clayton decided to do this movie, he approached um, Archibald and said, hey, can we use your play to make a movie? And I want you to do the screenwriting. And he said, okay, I'll do that. But then they decided they wanted to go with the more psychological route. And William Archibald wanted nothing to do with that. Um, so they had to bring in a new screenwriter and who did they bring in but truman capote um which is why when you see this movie sometimes when it's listed under country of origin it will say uk and the usa because truman capote was involved with it but other than that this is purely a british film oh okay yeah um, we don't have as many american films in these lists it seems <laughs> um not so far. Not so far. And you know what? You might be right for season one. As I'm thinking through. The, um, so, so it's foreign buddy films. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, Truman Capote came in. Uh, probably most well known to people for Breakfast at Tiffany's. I mean, that was him. Um, and he, he um, gave the play, the screen play a, a good old shot of psychological thriller yeah, um very much and so the movie stars uh a bunch of people who you're not necessarily gonna know at the time some of them were very famous um so for instance uh michael redgrave played the uncle which i assume is vanessa redgrave's father or something um that's a great question I, I don't know, know the answer to might be okay, but he, uh, he was like, a he was a headliner when, when they listed the movie, he got like top billing and he's in it for what? Three minutes, <laughs> which is what you said about the triangle with the one Heather. Yes. Right. Um, but, uh, back in 1961, he was a famous actor. He he's been, he went through his career. He was in 76 movies. Uh, he died in 85. Um, and if I were to list the movies to you, you would know none of them. <laughs> but apparently in England, they were uh, a big hits. Um, the lady who plays Mrs. Gross uh, was played by Meg Jenkins. Um, again, uh, she was in 109 movies dating back to like 1932. Wow. Um, and you wouldn't know any of them. But she was a recognizable face. Other, the main star of the film, Deborah Kerr, um, she was in some films that you might recognize. I recognized her name. Yes. I recognized Redgrave, but it didn't look it up. But yeah. Um, she was in a couple episodes of The Avengers. Okay. Um, the old 60s right. spy thriller, not superheroes. Right, right. <laughs> uh, she was in the original film of King Solomon's Mines. Okay. Um, the 80s, the famous remake. Um, she was also in a version of Julius Caesar. Um, <laughs> Who hasn't been. <laughs> now we're getting into the big hitters, though. She was also in From Here to Eternity. Um, she was in An Affair to Remember. 
and she's probably most well known for being in The King and I. Oh, okay. In fact, when they were casting The King and I, Yul Brenner specifically asked for her. Nice. Wow. Okay, um, so there's a little cachet for some of these actors. Yes. Uh, there are two child actors in the film. And that's our uh, buddies. That's our those buddies. are our buddies, yeah. Um, one of them was named Martin Stevens. Uh, he plays Miles, the older brother of the two in the movie. Uh, he only did 18 movies. His last one was called The Witches in 1966. He's still alive. Um, and like you can get a hold of his agent like if you want to book him for something. But he hasn't worked in a really long time, at least not in theater. Uh, Pamela Franklin, on the other hand, plays his sister, Flora. Uh, she was in 58 movies, and when I say movies, I should really say TV shows, because she was in all kinds of TV series. She was in Fantasy Island. Um, Again, who hasn't been? <laughs> right. But she was in all kinds of stuff, and to the best of my knowledge, she's still alive. Oh, interesting. There is a very minor... There's like three minor characters in this film. The cast is not huge. Mm -mm. Like a lot of these movies, it's been very small cast for most of these. Yeah. Right. Um, there's, uh, Anna who is like the housekeeper. And I think she has one line. Um, there's miss Jessup who has no lines. Right, just a very intense stare. Right. And then there's Peter Quint. Um, and he also has no lines aside from evil cackling. Cackle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the interesting part is um, you had two very famous actors who wanted the role of Peter Quint. And they were both turned down by Jack Clayton. One of those um, was Cary Grant. Oh, wow. And the other was your friend and mine, Sir Alec Guinness. Wow. And uh, neither one of them got a role in this movie, huh. even though they asked for it. That's interesting, especially, uh, you know, very British, you know, Sir Alec. He didn't want yeah. to do Star Wars. <laughs> right. Yeah, but he wanted to do this. Yeah, interesting. Um, the other classification that I put this film under is also a, a historic film. There are, in the horror genre, what I consider historical films. Whether you like them or not, they s definitely affected the entire genre that would be a movie that for your college course on horror cinematography would be a must watch absolutely uh seven is a good example seven set the tone for the 90s i mean yeah. not not just in horror but like even like as a graphic designer like the Trixie font suddenly was everywhere it was on everyone's album covers it was in everyone's posters and that like started with seven. Um, there are other ones. Um, Rocky horror picture show was a genre bending film. Um, Black Christmas. I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah. But if you want to see the first time you ever had a slasher film shot from the perspective of the slasher, that's where you have to go to watch that movie. And so the innocence is also one of those movies. Uh, it is definitely a historical film because this movie has been redone a bazillion times. Right. We talked a little bit about that off air. And I was going to ask you uh, why you chose this one over any of the 20 or so uh, remakes and other various versions of the movie. And I think you just answered that. Yeah. Uh, it, it was it was the first most successfully done, and even to this day, uh, you know, we talked about the haunting at Bly Manor, um, and while it was a serviceable Netflix series, uh, what they managed to do in an hour and twenty eight minutes on in black and white in 1961 is so much more impactful yes. than what they did over the span of five episodes. Yeah. We could probably do a whole episode on uh, that Netflix show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The good and the bad. Right. Um, so it's an important film. It, it, it uh, shows up a lot. One of the other things um, that. I always dislike about older movies is that they, a lot of times the script will be cheesy or the 
acting is way over the top and I just can't bring myself to sit through it. Um, this movie only has slight traces of that. Yeah. If it was colorized, it would be probably look very much more of a modern eighties, nineties movie. Maybe. Uh, yeah, it definitely had a good, I mean, I, even me, I noticed it, it looked felt, you know, it was a big Hollywood type movie. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, this is a, one of those rare ones on the list that we have for the season. That was a big Hollywood type movie. I mean, for, from the British standpoint, this was, you know, uh, the budget for this was 430,000 pounds, which in 1961 was a lot of money. Right. Um, Cause actors didn't need 34 million to do 12 minutes. Deborah Kerr got $400,000 for this. That was, that was her take of it. Um, overall, the world, uh, the, the gross worldwide was listed at $30,000. So financially it was a failure. But if, if you talk to Guillermo del Toro, this is one of his top five horror movies of all time. <laughs> And that's Which, saying something. Yeah. Uh, this is my influence for Pan's Labyrinth. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You're like, I, okay. Um, this, this movie and the next one we'll be talking about, both of them deal with um, ambiguity. Um, you have relationships between friends, um, loved ones who are close. And with the ambiguity, something horrible happens to somebody and it might be that close friend or relative's fault, or it might not be. They don't really necessarily resolve it for you. Right. And also like the next movie, this one has a lot of amazing production things that happened in it. Yes. I even noticed that. Yes. So, um, first the, the fastest one, uh, um, Joe Clark was the editor of this movie and the editing, um, not just the cuts from scene to scene, which are very well paced and very well done, but he did scenes where he would have four videos overlaying yeah. at the same time. And in 1961, that was a tricky thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, for, not... for all the kiddies that meant actually four sets of film and actually putting them on each other and running it and splicing right. it. And yeah. 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 Very much a chore. It's, it's just astronomical. I can't even imagine when you, when you watch um, that dream sequence towards the end of the film, the amount of time. And he, he loved this job. He was working with Clayton and they were hanging out so much. Um, neither of them were married. They got apartments close to the studio and the two of them would like go out like after work every day have a couple beers, talk about, you know, cricket or whatever, and then go back to the apartment. And then the next day, come back and do the same thing. That's great. And so Clark just absolutely loved working on this film. Uh, now, the other one that's much more um, impactful and there's a lot more to say about him is Freddie Francis, the cinematographer. Uh he did amazing work on this film working in what was new technology at the time, the whole cinema scope thing. Um, he wanted the film to have a claustrophobic feel. He wanted as the film t- went on that you felt that um, Miss Giddens was slowly getting put into a box that there was no way out for her. Um, and so he, went through and he did these little things throughout the movie to like achieve that just subtly to reinforce it. And one of the big things he did was since it was in CinemaScope, he had the super wide lens. He actually painted the edges of the lens black so that there was constantly this dark shadow. Framing I wondered her. about that. Yeah. And you can see scenes. It happens at night when she's indoors and you can watch because as the camera pans, you'll see spots that are lit up that just kind of go dark as the edge of the frame hits it. And you can see the slight curvature of the painting, oh, okay. which is just brilliant. Um, Freddie and, Fran- and, and I see things like that. We talked about 
um, practical effects a couple of mm-hmm. episodes ago. This is one of those things that sometimes the best working with limitations, you get some yes. of the best results yes. uh, and those little things and some of the other shots they do where it's like real close to one person and somebody far away in the background. And there were a couple of those shots too. And they re- obviously really stuck out. And I'm thinking, I-, I can't think of another movie before this in time that did those types of things. It was a matrix effect. I mean, we saw it in the matrix yeah. and everybody's like, Ooh, and I'm like, yeah, but this had it, you know, 30 right. years before that. And there was no CGI involved with this. None. No, no strings. Right. There's no strings to tie them down. Um, Freddie Francis also was the cinematographer for The Elephant Man, um, another famous film, um, and other films that you and I would know. Dune, the original Dune back in the 80s. He uh, was the cinematographer for that and Cape Fear. Oh, wow. And I thought Cape Fear, actually, when I when I found out, I started reflecting on it. It had that same kind of trapped feel to it as you right. watched it that he achieved in this hmm. nice cool um there's a few other short notes before we actually get into the meat of the of the movie itself when this was released in england um it was a rated x film which in england meant you were not allowed in the theater if you were under the age of 16 so it's worse than R. Your parents can't take you to see this movie, but you had to be at least 16 years old to go see it. Um, and talking to a younger generation, they might be like, you know, what's in this movie? Well, nothing that's really going to shock you. <laughs> Not by today's standards. Right. But if you look at it through the lens of 1961, there's some really shocking stuff that happens in this film. It, well, yeah, just the whole mental health Issue. Yes. Um, it was. I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say it was nominated uh, for eight different awards, and it won three of those. Oh, nice. Um. And I. Oh, well, the rest of it we'll talk about as we get to it. But okay. what were you gonna say? I was gonna say one of the things that stuck out to me, and this has always been a big thing in movies, is the musical score. Mm. This had a lush and fantastic musical score right from the beginning underlying just about every bit of the movie yeah. helping set the tone and the feel and it wasn't like we have now synthesizers it wasn't it was an orchestra and it was full i mean if you like the music in star wars i would equate this to that because there weren't many scenes that were completely silent except when it needed that effect in the closed box like you said now i don't want to sound like everyone's grandpa here <laughs> but I think back in the day, your music scores were so much better because you were paying for an orchestra. And so you didn't want to sit there and rush, you know, at the last minute and do a tweak here and a change here and then write some song off the, off the cuff that you were going to pay to some guy with a synthesizer and a computer who was just going to crank this thing out and it would cost you 30 grand. This was a full on orchestra. So you wanted everything to be, you wanted the scoring to be perfect. Right. Yeah. And not to be, you know, like some sort of elitist or anything, but I'm going to bet if you can write a score for an orchestra, you might know a little bit more about music than somebody who sits around and piddles on a, on a synthesizer all day long. You know, it's the same as a lot of modern skills, you know, a lot of, good teachers will push the kids to learn the old way of doing it. So you understand it. Yes. I know you don't need to record on reel to reel cassettes and you don't have to physically splice it, but knowing how to do that can help a lot in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, really funny. Just as an aside on Twitter, I, um, you know, photography is one of the things that I follow and this guy posted this question out there. He's like, how do you think social media has influenced your photographic style? And I'm like, what if you started taking pictures before social media? Yeah. It's like an entire generation is like just been raised to be like, this is what pictures are for. Right. Right. It's kind of a narrow scope, but you know, yeah, very much so. All right. Yeah. So this movie starts out. Clayton's just, Ingenious. The movie starts out, it's 45 seconds of black screen. And there's a little girl 
singing a creepy song. <laughs> yeah. Now the song's called Oh Willow, Oh Willow Wally. Um, and I tr- searched and looked and it turns out Oh Willow Wally was written specifically for this movie. So, um, you're not going to find like, you know, like with Byzantium where I'm like, well, this is some ancient hymn that was talking about the slaughter of the end. Of... No, this was written specifically for this, but this song has been redone a billion times. Um, if you look it up on, on YouTube, you can find, uh, you know, like those old sixties family bands, you know, right. Like right. Pre Osmonds, you'll find them doing this song. Uh, and then, of course, they redid it for the haunting on Bly House. So, like this was credit music. So you have this little girl creepily singing with just a black screen for forty-five whole seconds. And this is before you know video or anything like that. Forty-five seconds is like actual film, right? That they paid for by the foot. So his choice to do that says a lot. Yeah, 24 frames a second. That's quite a few in the industry. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but it's very impactful. You just imagine sitting in a black theater, you know, and the newsreels have gone past and everything gets dark and the screen stays dark and this girl's voice just starts singing. It's you know, little... another movie that comes to mind that did that same effect? Which one? The first Star Trek movie. Oh. It starts off black screen with music. Yeah. Um, it gets broken um, by the introduction of the 20th Century Fox logo. Um, Marketing tease. <laughs> <laughs> and then the credits start to roll. Um, and as the credits are, are as, as the opening credit panels are popping up, there is a very close uh, shot of clasped hands. And as um, the the credits keep going, the hands change position on occasions, but it becomes evident that this person is, is not just wringing their hands or actively praying. And it goes back a little further, pans back just a little further. So you can see her face. And while she's praying, she's praying about saving the children. She wants to save the children, not destroy the children. And it just kind of boom, your tone is set right there. Yeah. Yeah, a little creepy, a little psychotic. Yeah. Yeah, because she's not she doesn't sound well right. as she's I mean, saying it. You know, what governess says I don't want to destroy the children. <laughs> I mean it's just yes. you have to physically say that out loud. Low bar. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna hire you. Just make sure you don't destroy the children. Yeah. Well that's really what he says, essentially. It's like yeah. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. So we go to the uncle scene. Um right from there and the uncle's in this study in london and um here she is sitting there and he's like look i got these orphaned niece and nephew i want nothing to do with them i don't even live with them just go take care of them that's basically what he says yeah and she at first she's uh she's demurring across the whole thing she's like i really don't know that you know this would be my first job i'm just a preacher's daughter I don't know that I should be the one to do this. And he basically says, no, you'll be fine. Hop on the stage. Get, get out which, there. Which gives you the feeling that it's almost like, well, I don't care. I'm just going to take the first person that comes along. Or I've had so many other people come. I don't care who you are. Just do the job. You know, and that's true. He does go through and mention that the kids had a governess that they loved and she passed away. Yeah. And even at that, he is cold and heartless about it. He's like, just when everything was right, wouldn't you know it? She died. Right. <laughs> well, how inconvenient for you, sir. <laughs> Messed my life up for the day. Right. Um, I honestly think that the uncle in The Innocence is probably portrayed far worse than in any other version I've seen of this. And I don't mean like the acting was bad i just mean the character himself is just portrayed as such a dick cold and heartless yeah yeah. exactly um but fortunately that's all the more we see of the uncle that opening scene he does bring up an interesting 
theme that comes back later is he asks her, do you have an imagination? Yes, he does. Um, and she says she does. And he says, well, that's good. You know, having an imagination is good. Um, in the end, it might not have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, for her, we, at least. <laughs> for her, at least. <laughs> we go from the shot of her uh, in the office to her riding in a coach and two. And um, maybe it's me looking at it through, you know, late 20th century eyes, but in black and white with the high contrast they had going on, um, that black coach, the guy in the top hat, all black horses, it looks like a hearse. Yeah, I think it was supposed to. I think there's, there's a lot of subtle suggestions throughout the movie. I, I, yes. in many ways. The music's one of them, but mm-hmm. again, a lot of the visuals. Right. You know. And that was the first thing I thought as I saw the thing riding along. I'm like, oh, that's a hearse. The funny thing is when I first watched this movie, I watched it with the same attitude that I read it with. I'm like, this is just a ghost story. But as I've been rewatching it, the psychological elements of it really jump out. The more yeah. times you see it, in my yeah. mind. Again, if you like Hitchcock, this is probably a good movie to check out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they get to the gates of Bly, which is uh, the name of the house where the kids live, Bly Manor. And before she can ride through the gates in this hearse-like vehicle, she tells him to stop. And she wants to walk. So she wants to carry herself into her own fate. Now... That's maybe me projecting a little, uh, you know, symbolism and stuff onto it. It might have just been, oh, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to walk through the British countryside. And and if you go with the psychosis whole aspect, this is almost her last gasp of normality. <laughs> Absolutely. And because she, she makes the choice to go in. So it's like she's choosing this. Yep. That's kind of how I look at it. Um. We also uh, didn't do the spoiler warning before this because oh, honestly, belated spoiler warning. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't know this story by now, <laughs> right? Yeah, you, you you've really kind of been sleeping. Uh, but you're right; the supernatural or the insanity begins almost instantly. Now, this is where I make the argument for the supernatural end of it. She is walking in. As she's walking in, she comes to a pond. And she hears a voice calling out for Flora. That voice calls a couple times. She has not met the girl yet. She knows nothing about what's going, what's gone on at this place. She doesn't have a whole lot in the way of, she ha- they don't give us any clues that she has any idea about what the tensions are or the dynamics are like in the house. She just hears this female voice calling for Flora. If you're not, uh, you know, if you're not necessarily watching it the first time through, you might not think a whole lot about it because kids are constantly running around being called for. But Flora is the first person she meets. And the shot where he meets, where she meets Flora, it starts with a reflection of Flora in the water, not the girl herself, right. But a reflection. Yeah. I, I, we, we've mentioned our friend that like symbolism a lot. This is a definite movie up his sleeve. Oh, his absolutely. Yeah. would love this film. And I, so we've talked a little bit about the supernatural, which is this scene is very supernatural ish, but we've talked about the madness and psychosis. So all of this could be her imaginings, her own thing, but in a way, what if it, really is supernatural and it's the ghosts that are driving her crazy. So it's crazy. You mentioned that because I was thinking about this last night and I know, I don't know. It might be in poor form to mention other movies (laughs) as we're talking about one, but there's a very easy to find film. It's, it's like brand new to Netflix. It's called the wind. Okay. It's a period. Oh, yeah, I saw that preview. Okay. It's a period piece from uh, takes place in the 19th century frontiers, America. Um, and the whole basic gist of the movie is there's like demonic possession happening. 
but it is done in this super ambiguous way where when it's done, you're like, is there possession going on or did someone just lose their mind? And you can sit there and argue. It could be the same thing. Yes. And that's, I'm, uh, yes, exactly. That's exactly what you get with this movie. And you mentioned, because I was saying, well, is the psychological aspect was always there. You said not really. It was mostly a ghost story. It was more modern, you know, which I guess you probably could argue that uh, Henry James put some of that psychological stuff in there on purpose, which led them to this. You know, he might have been way ahead of his time. But either way, I, you know, that was a question in every scene of this movie. Is it supernatural ghosts? Yes. Is it her going crazy or are the ghosts driving her crazy? Because right. there's so much of both throughout the movie. And I, I kind of look at the turn of the screw as a, a good embodiment of society in that back at the turn of the century, you know, he wrote it in what, 1897 or something like that. When it came out, that was ghosts. And looking at looking back at it now, we can be like, you know what? That whole witch trial thing, that was just really mass hysteria. Um, but back then it was like legit. There are witches right. running around. That might be the same case here where he just wrote a ghost story. And then people looking back on it now are like, well, it's not really a ghost story. It's just somebody going insane. Yeah. So, so it, either he's way ahead of his time or he was more of a master than he even realized. Yes. Um, or so maybe he really, really sucked and he wanted a ghost <laughs> story, but it came out this weird psychological thing because he couldn't get it right. <laughs> damn it. That's not at all what I wanted to do. Yeah, well, all take these him people the reading list. stuff into my story. <laughs> He's rolling right now. Yeah. There's another ghost story about to happen. So, <laughs> so we're introduced to Flora this way. Uh, from a reflection in the water, the camera pans up. She's standing on a rock in this pond. Um, and she is instantly charming. She is very nice. She is sweet. Uh, she loves Miss Giddens. Um, and she has a turtle. She loves her turtle. Uh, Rupert is the turtle's name. Uh, and it's not a turtle. It's a tortoise, which we find out later. Tortoises don't like to be put in the water. Uh, Turtles do. Um, So they walk back to the house and we are introduced to Mrs. Gross, who is the head housekeeper. Um, Mrs. Gross is much older than Miss Giddens, but as you would have in that period of England, people are aware of their class and their standing in the house. And so she instantly um, is very uh, demure to, whatever Miss Giddens wants, Miss right. Giddens gets. She comes in when she walks into the house. Um, they did a really nice job of keeping the house kind of well lit. It looks big. It looks spacious. It's open. It's opulent. Very and gothic. Yes. But it definitely looks like the kind of place that you could run around in. There's lots of stuff, you know, you know, as opposed to later in the movie where the whole thing really just feels like, the entire weight of the house is sitting on top of her. Right. But right now at the start, it's very open. Um, so this is where we find out that perhaps the voice she heard calling Flora was a supernatural one because Miss Giddens says to Miss Gross, I heard you calling her and Miss Gross says, Oh, it wasn't me. Maybe it was Anna, the poor maligned character who like has one line and you never ever see. Um, but uh, it wasn't Mrs. Gross who was calling her, which means where did that voice come from? And again, was it in her head or was it something supernatural? Right. But the way Miss Gross talks and acts, it again hints that it's a ghost supernatural. She it, throughout everything she says and does is very much like, well, I know there's a ghost. I know it's haunted, but I'm going to ignore that. She and, has that feel. And Flora mentions that later when Flora's going to bed, um, she's talking about going to bed and how she always likes to look in the dark. And Mrs. Gross is so silly because she always closes her eyes in the dark. And so that kind of reinforces what you're saying. Mrs. Gross 
blatantly leaves out important details all the time <laughs> because they're too uncomfortable to talk about. Well, uh, you you can't believe it in this society because you'll go, you'll be considered mad. Right. Which again is the other ambiguous theme. And again, maybe you are. Yeah. Um so that's the introduction to like I would say three quarters of the cast of this movie is right there. Uh, we have a scene where Flora's taking a bath and this just 110% set for me the tone of the children because she is being a complete shit in the bathtub. She is splashing around, bubbles everywhere. You know, that's hardwood floor under there. <laughs> it's just water is getting everywhere and the adults are like laughing and like egging her on like this is an okay behavior. And that seems to be a, a kind of a common thing that runs throughout this film is the kids are completely kowtowed to anything they want, they get right. Which covers up some of their behaviors with at least Mrs. Gross, you know, but now this new governess kind of starts noticing things. So it goes back again. Are they possessed demons with the spirits of the ghosts or, or is she finally just like, well, they're kind of crap and I need to clamp down on them. Maybe it, it's it's questionable. Everything becomes it a is. Question. It the very bizarre thing <laughs> of all the strange things for me to be like, what's this happening? Miss Giddens sleeps in Flora's room. Yeah, they have a house which Mrs. Gross <laughs> says is way too big with tons of rooms that are just locked because nobody ever uses them, and yet the two of them are going to double up in one room to sleep in i can get that to, for heating purposes but well but maybe again she's trying to protect the girl maybe she knows perhaps. it's haunted you know there there could be possibilities well flora introduces the notion of ghosts and this is the first actual open mention of ghosts uh because as she's doing her prayer um, it's the one everyone knows now i lay me down to sleep i pray the lord my soul to keep if i die before i wake she turns to, um, she messes it up. Yes. Very, um, very. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is an interesting little thing that he put in there, but she turns, uh, to Miss Giddens and says, um, so where will he take my soul if I die? She's like, well, she'll take it to heaven. She's like, what if I'm not going to heaven? I.e. what if I'm such a little shit for splashing around in the bathtub? <laughs> That's that's the cutoff line right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Flora says, will I just be a doomed spirit to walk the world forever? And I'm like, well, that conversation just kind of took a big turn. Right. I mean, it was just a cute little kid saying her prayer. And now all of a sudden she's doomed to haunt the earth forever. Well, and that's the first hint i guess is she possessed is she crazy or the kids crazy because the the mess up she makes isn't if i should die before i wake it's if i should wake before i die and she kind of cuts it off and that's super creepy but the look on her face made me wonder did she say that on purpose <laughs> and the kids throughout this movie their bad behavior a lot of times is did they do this on purpose which again are they possessed uh, yeah. The spirits possessing them, which is maybe Miss Giddens is right all along. Yeah, and that would yeah. be a good reason to sleep in the room. Um, but yeah, that that was a real creepy. You know, it's like <laughs> if you didn't get creeped out by the hey Flora earlier, now you've got shivers running up down your spine. <laughs> yeah. Now they do. Um, they do this thing that I always, this is like a personal creepy thing for me, but Miss Giddens is asleep. And while she's asleep, Flora gets out of her bed and like stands over and just watches her sleep, which is uber creepy to me. And then to go back to my, my pushing for this being a haunting story, she goes to the open window and she's looking outside and she's humming that a willow wally song and then she looks off in one direction and smiles yeah now we find out later that that song happens to have been the deceased governess favorite song which makes me think 
maybe she sees the ghost and she's trying to be, you know, make the ghost happy kind of thing. And, and it's a great thing about this movie compared to a lot of modern sensibility movies. It hints at stuff, but then you're left to wonder. They don't blatantly show there's a ghost there. They don't blatantly show this, uh, you know, they leave it to your wonder and imagination, which I always think is much more creepy and builds the tension. And it gives you a lot more to think about, talk about, makes the movie much more fuller and richer. Absolutely. And uh, they did also there with that conversation, they mention again about imagination and imagining things. So that yeah. keeps coming up. Yeah. Um, the next day we find that a letter has been sent to the house from the uncle. He received it about miles, the son who's at uh, some boarding school and he doesn't even want to open it. So he just sent it to the governess. Just deal with this. Um, so she opens it and finds out that miles has been expelled. Um, a cute little note that they put in there is she gives it uh, to Mrs. Gross to read. And Mrs. Gross is like, eh, I can't read, which is, you know, back in the late 19th century was not a rare thing, you know, for like help around the house. Right. Now, if you want to work, you know, check out at dollar general, you got to have a college degree back then. You can clean a whole manor uh, without anything. So yes, room and board (laughs) included and a little bit of cash on the side. Um, so miles has been expelled. We don't know why, They go to the train station to pick him up, and we finally meet Miles. And before that, in the bath scene, Flora goes, Miles is coming home. With Before all of this. Yes. Uh, Which, again, this weird tie with the kids. Like, she already knew that was happening. And then the next day, they get the letter and find out he's been expelled. He is coming home. Um, He is this charming guy. As the train's rolling in, he's doing the whole thing, sticking his head out the window, you know, as the train's going along, looking all dapper, his hair's perfect. Um, The first thing he does when he gets out of the train, he hands her flowers. These are not the moves of, like, your typical 10-year-old boy. Right, little Lord Fauntleroy there. Yes. (laughs) Um, Once Miles arrives, cinematographically, they increase the contrast, even on the outdoor shots. And um, a couple interesting things. They used so many lights to get the contrast to the point that Clayton wanted that um, Kerr actually would wear sunglasses between takes because the set was so bright. And when they were outside, because he wasn't getting the shadows he wanted from the trees in the background, um, and you can't light you know, over that huge of a distance, he actually would have them paint the trees black on the shadow side That's just awesome. to increase it, wow. which is just... All, that that little bit of trivia always sounded to me like the the knaves in um, uh, through the looking glass painting the roses colors. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, go out and paint those trees so there's some actual shadow. And that type of technique, I mean, obviously they're doing it to increase the tension. It makes you feel unsettled when mm-hmm. you're sitting there watching, especially in a theater. It reminds me of uh, Three Kings, that movie where it was very bleached out because they were in the desert. Yeah, uh, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, Miles comes into the house. Um, He is just, he's just the little man. He, you know, he's, he speaks perfectly. Uh, He doesn't seem to have, like, Flora is fascinated by reptiles. She's got this turtle. There's scenes where she's put like flowers on her turtle. She still seems like a little girl. At times. At times. Miles, I never really get the feeling that Miles is just some little innocent kid. He's got that used carbon skeezy feel (laughs) to him about everything. You know, even when he gets off the train, you know, it's like he's acting so perfect to impress people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's really just trying to be super slick. Yeah, that kid was really good. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I was really disappointed to see that, you know, his career basically stopped in 66. Um, there's a scene where they're coloring, um, and Miles is coloring a horse because Miles owns a pony. And um, Flora is coloring something else. And Flora desperately wants... Um, Miss Giddens' approval 
I mean, she she colors this picture and hands it to her and is like, I can color too. And of course, Miss Giddens is like, oh, it's a lovely cloud. And she's like, no. And she turns the picture and she's <laughs> like, this is what it is. And she's like, oh, maybe you'll be a famous artist. And she's like, you hear that, Miles? Right. I'm going to be a famous artist. And her, and it was said that her and Miss Jessup had a really close relationship. Yes, she and Miss Jessup had a very close relationship. Now, Miles had a very close relationship with someone else who is yet to be introduced this late in the film. Um, they decide they're going to play a game of hide and seek. And it, uh, because they're asking Miss Giddens about her childhood, you know, did she come from a big house? No, she was, she was a preacher's daughter, one of several. Um, and you know, well, what did they ever do? Well, most of the time they had to be quiet, but when daddy was away they would play hide and seek and so the kids think this sounds great so she decides they're going to play hide and seek uh, mrs gross points out it's almost their bedtime and she's like oh we'll just have one game and and um especially looking back on it now if that was me in a giant house that you know was kind of weird and creepy i don't know that i'd been wanting to play hide and seek just yeah. me personally yeah. but she decides to play some hide and seek so um She's counting. The kids take off. She starts walking around the house. She's very excited to be playing the game. Um, she gets to an intersection, and this woman in the costuming, and this is amazing. They're always dressed to the nines. This woman, perfectly dressed, perfectly upright, walks across an intersection of the hallway, and she calls out Anna, thinking it's the housekeeper the poor forlorn housekeeper who never gets mentioned. Um, it is not. The person doesn't even acknowledge that they've been spoken to. This is a manifestation of the ghost of Miss Jessel, the previous housekeeper, uh, the previous governess who has passed away. Now I say a manifestation because is it a ghost? Is it just in her head? We don't know, but she appears to be confused because she thinks it's Anna. But then she never gives it another thought. Yeah, that was a little weird. Yeah. She continues all the way up to the attic. Uh, she walks what? in. Okay, wait, let me back up there. Yes, sure. it seemed a little weird watching it. But if you were starting to suspect your own in, you know, sanity, you might very well dismiss things. Like, nope, I didn't see anything. I'm just going to continue on. I mean, we've all kind of done that when we see something weird sometimes, you know. Yeah, that's got to be the wind. I'm just going to move on. So, oh, well, Mrs. Guess, Gross. Yeah, right. Close your eyes in the dark and just say it wasn't there. <laughs> right. So, okay, I, you know, I'll back up on that one a bit. Okay. Go ahead. She walks into the storeroom, um, and the first thing is, long before the whole clowns are creepy thing, she walks in and there's this <laughs> bobblehead clown whose head is rocking back and forth. And I'm like, it's apparently not just us because that's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she walks over and stops it rocking back and forth. And the whole time the music is building the tension as she's going around, she finds a music box again, creepy. And it is playing that. Oh, Willow Wally song. Right. So I took it as she sees the thing moving and, oh, the kids must have come by and got in that put the music on and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that was my assumption, too, was that the, this was the kids. Still, as a visual, it was a creepy image of the thing just. Yeah. Tsh, tsh. yeah I've seen YouTube videos look like that nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Um, she opens up the music box and there is a photograph that's been broken of a handsome, swarthy man. Uh, it's, it's, uh, oh, what do they call those? Well, the yeah, name escapes me, but yeah. it, it's the name for like a small portrait of a person that you would right, keep. Right. And so she's looking at it. And as she's doing that, Miles comes in out of nowhere. This is like a jump scare. You yes. Know? There are a couple of those. Yes. And he like hugs her and he's talking about the game and she's getting very uncomfortable. Because he's hugging her very tightly, and she will not let go. And he will not let go. And the only thing that breaks this tension is Flora shows up. And the tension is broken, and Flora's like, now it's your turn to hide. And so 
all of a sudden, just like she flipped a switch from being uncomfortable and creeped out, she's like, okay, I'll go hide. Right. So the kids start to count. And, and, and I think this is big with the kids. Every scene is almost pretty much something weird and creepy and something completely normal then. So it keeps you on yeah. edge. Like you don't know yeah, yeah. what to think. Build the tension, break it. Build the tension, break it. She runs off, heads downstairs, decides to hide behind a curtain. You know, that big poofy dress, not the best hiding place in my opinion, but okay. Um, she hides behind the curtain and she notices that her shoes are sticking out. So she backs up. And as she backs up, you can see there's a statue out through the window on the patio behind her. And the statuary at this place, super creepy. <laughs> They're all like these Greco-Roman stone sculptures of like figures writhing in pain. I mean, right. they, they none of them look comfortable. <laughs> um, so she's backing up. You see that. And then all of a sudden swarthy man appears out of the shadows and seems to kind of come forward and she's startled and screams and he goes back. Yeah. Then she does the very un recommended thing and goes out on the patio. <laughs> right. We, we missed something. Okay. Back up. Spoiler. Oh, heck there goes my phone. Okay. Sorry. Back up. Go ahead. Um, before the hide and seek, there's a scene where she's outside and um, she's uh, cutting roses from the garden. Oh yeah, that's right. Speaking of statuary and she uncovers this statue of this creepy looking uh, cherub. Yeah. Like a demonic cherub. Yeah. <laughs> and the camera zooms in and a beetle crawls out of its mouth, dangles for a second and falls. And isn't it there with like broken arms, hands or something? Yes. The the yeah. cherub is holding two broken off hands at the wrists. Yeah. Um, she startled by this backs up, turns and looks and up in a top tower, there's a man, a male figure standing at the tower, looking down. And so she runs across the garden and to the tower and goes in into the tower. Now, they do something very interesting with the sound here, because up until that time, every time she's outside, all you hear are like the birds. Birds are very prominent in this. You can hear them singing all the time. As soon as she walks into the tower, you hear flies. I didn't even notice that. She steps inside and you hear the buzzing of flies. She goes up these steps. They do a shot where it shows up. It, it's a very uh, tempting visual of like the stairs going up, spiraling stairs. She takes the stairs up and the only person there is miles and a bunch of dubs. And she asks who was up there. And he's like, it's only been me. And it obviously couldn't have been him because it was definitely a full grown man who was looking over the edge of the tower. Right. So again, is she crazy? Is it a ghost? You know, there's a lot of questions. If miles was up there, is it the ghost inhabiting miles? You know, miles is the carrier. Yeah. Right. When she's playing hide and seek, that man she associates with the person in the tower, the man who appears behind her. Mrs. Gross shows up and she's like, I heard you scream. You're super pale. What's going on? And she's like, I saw this man. Wait, I saw this man in this picture. Right. Yeah. We don't see his face as a ghost until after the picture. So again, right. a little ambiguous. Was, yes. So um, we find out that the picture is of a man named Quint, who was uh, the uncle's valet. And Quint apparently was kind of a horrible person. Um, very charming, but horrible. A little bit like Miles. Yes. Uh, we find out that Quint died. Quint didn't just die. Quint uh, liked to drink. And Quint uh, was coming home one night and... Someone either attacked him or he slipped and fell on the steps and hit his head and died out in the front steps. And poor young Miles is the one who found the body. And that's the story of how he died, though. So, again, you got to wonder. That is um, because you find out that Quint and Miss Jessel uh, were an item. And not only were they an item, they were kind of gross about it. Um. They were like, 
messing around in rooms and in the manor, not really caring if somebody caught them or not. Um, you find out that maybe the kids might have like seen them doing stuff and not that they were purposely doing that, but they just really didn't seem to care. And so when Miss Giddens asks how Miss Jessel dies, we're told that she basically died of a broken heart. At, this happened after Quint dies. Just broke poor Miss Jessel's heart. Um, again, Mrs. Gross holding back information, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so Miss Giddens is like, I think it's the ghost of that man. And Miss Gross is like, what? And then you hear the kids laughing. And the kids are standing in the balcony, looking down, laughing at both of them. And Again, it's your typical horror movie kid laughter that scares you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just seems creepy. This has obviously put uh, Miss Giddens on edge because you find out the next day she's in the classroom teaching them. And Flora is being the typical spoiled brat that she has been. She's purposely making screechy noises with her uh, like chalkboard, her slate. Um, and Miss Giddens actually like yells at her to stop. And then Miles piles on and he's like, stop it. Um, and that's the first sign of tension you have between the three of them. That's like that open and overt. Right. It's and of definitely course, building. yes, of course, Flora cries. And then Miss Giddens comes over and she's like, oh, I'm so horrible. You're fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. And they all get <laughs> together for this big group hug. Um, Which, again, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, she flip flops uh, and here she does it again. She's uptight. She's irritated. It's like then it's all fine. She all smile and roses, which is another very common like movie thing when someone's going crazy. You know, yeah, it's an easy thing to portray that people can see. So they decide they're going to, uh, you know, to make it up her being so mean to Flora. They decide they're going to pretend it's Flora's birthday. And so the kids run off to get ready for it. And Miss Giddens and Miss Gross hang out down at the bottom of the stairs. And while they're hanging out down there, Miss um, Giddens is pushing Miss Gross for more information. And it turns out that while Miss Jessel was Flora's favorite, Quint was Miles's favorite. And interesting that they both died. <laughs> yes, they did both die. Um, so the kids show up. They come down all dressed up oddly, you know, like little kids will, carrying candles um, and tell Miss Giddens and Miss Gross to have a seat. And as they sit down, Flora's like, now Miles is going to recite a poem. And Miles proceeds to recite verbatim the creepiest poem I think I've ever heard a child recite. It, with a stare and a creepy low voice. And I mean, again, the guy, the kid, amazing actor in this part. Yeah, absolutely. And I tried to find out where that poem came from. And that poem turns out came from no other than Mr. Truman Capote. He <laughs> wrote it specifically for this, play, for oh, this wow. uh, movie. Um, <clears throat> the next day they're down at the lake at the pond we find out that um, Miles can row the boat but Flora's not supposed to she's too small um, and we see a figure standing in the middle of the lake in formal dress um, and it doesn't take too long to figure out that must be Miss Jessel yeah <clears throat> which if you've seen any of the other uh, versions of this movie, you, you know who it is right away that, before yes. it's even kind of hinted at. So, yes. Um, so we see this figure standing out there. No one else seems to see it. She asked Flora if she sees it. She asked Mrs. Gross if she sees it. Nobody sees it. Apparently, just Miss Giddens sees the ghost out there. Um, it's the first appearance of the ghost in the lake. We did see her gliding through the house at that one point in time. But we don't really, you know, it's the first time we see the ghost in the lake. And we're not really sure why. 
will we find out when they, they all go to church? And as they're going to church, the kids are running around um, holding back secrets, which has kind of become a theme here is that there's too many secrets being held in this house. Miss Jessel says at some point in time. Uh, I mean, Miss Giddens says at some point in time. Miss Giddens keeps pushing Mrs. Gross, and it turns out that Miss Jessel killed herself. She drowned herself in the lake, which makes all kinds of sense as to why we see her standing in the middle of the lake in a dress. So there again, Miss uh, Giddens didn't know that, but she saw the figure. So That's right. is she really going crazy, or is it really a ghost? Yes. Um, the funny thing about it is she refers to the ghosts not even as ghosts, but as abominations. Yeah. Now there are two of these abominations in the house. Um, you have the the abomination that is Peter Quint and the abomination that is Miss Jessel. Um, she finds Miss Jessel's gravestone, and sure enough, it would appear that the flowers that Flora was carrying, she had laid at the gravestone for her. And in church, the vicar told a story, uh, and I didn't finish my notes, uh, but it, it, I, I, I wanted to point it out, um, and I can't even recall what it was now. He tells a story that's relevant to, again, uh, imagination or spirits in the afterworld, you know, that type of thing. And I don't uh, remember it either. Yeah, I, I made a note, and I only have half a note, so I apologize. Oh, that's fine. It's the same thing. I'm sitting here trying to read my notes. I know your handwriting. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, so there's a night scene that happens where Miss Giddens is, hears a noise. She hears voices and she's walking through the house with a candelabra. And this is where the whole cramped down you know you have this whole cinema scope this super wide frame and most of it is just black between the lighting and the painting on the lens i mean and you, you feel the weight of the architecture on her as she's walking around very much and she's wearing an all white night dress so she looks very ghost like herself so it's, right. you know it's all these symbolic visual cues to lead you down the path of what they're showing you trying now to she say. She hears stuff, but she never actually sees anything. She runs around the house trying doors here and there. Um, at one point in time, there's another jump scare where she turns and there's a mask on the wall. And, you know, it's like projected to like spooky. But that's all it really is. It's like a jump scare. She goes back to her room and Flora is there and awake and says something about somebody being outside. And she walks over and looks down and in the circle of these horrible, hideous sculptures. You have Miles standing there. Um, and this upsets her a lot. She gets Miles um, and puts him back in bed. And he's like, oh, it was all just a joke. Because we were afraid we we're being too good. And good <laughs> kids are boring. And so we want to do something a little wicked. So I worked with Flora and we set this whole thing up so she would make you look out there and I'd be outside wandering around in my bare feet. Um, I don't know that the kids were good to start with. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't really need to make themselves naughtier. Yeah, but but that it's like, again, just him saying that. Not so much even being outside, but him saying that is the creepiest part the creepiest thing is like what what's wrong with these kids to even say that even and if it's not true why say it but if it is true why do that then say it. the whole thing again everything about the kids is half creepy more and more creepy as the movie goes on actually and it leads to the creepiest most unsettling part to the film for me is especially considering this is 1961 he says, oh, Miss Giddens, darling, give me a kiss. And like a full on kiss on the mouth from a 12 year old boy <laughs> to this. Well, Deborah Kerr was 40 when they filmed this. OK. Um, and it's not like a peck on the cheek. I mean, this is like lip lock. It's yeah. really I, I don't know why it, I find it so kiss. disturbing. Yes. It, it, yeah. It's not just. Yeah. And I. But, can, ag but again, it's not a 
we do have a few jump scares. It's not a modern jump scare movie. It's got all these things that make that add up together to just make the whole thing creepy and unsettling. And that probably would make most people squirm more than like, uh, you know, sticking your hand in worms or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's one of those things like a needle close to the eye kind of yeah. thing where you're just like, ew. Right. Um, the next day, uh, Flora is not easily found. She doesn't know where Flora is. And she heads down to the lake and Flora has taken the boat over to uh, a small uh, ghost island. Yeah. <laughs> where she's dancing all by herself to the music from the music box. And Miss Giddens goes out to get her and she looks and she sees the ghost of Miss Jessel and she just confronts because Miss Giddens concept is that we're going to make these kids admit what they're doing, that they're, being played by these ghosts they see them the ghosts are calling the shots and once they say it everything's going to be fine so she tries to get flora to admit that she sees the ghost of miss jessel there and flora has a complete shrieking meltdown terrible i mean like you can hear it through the house yeah and it just keeps going um miss gross although miss gross thinks what Miss Giddens has done is wrong in bringing up Miss Jessel because we find out that Flora was the one who found Miss Jessel's body in the pond. And of course, we just tuck all that away. We never actually deal with it. So um, so Mrs. Gross thinks that Miss Giddens is wrong for that. She has no idea where Flora got the language for the horrible, hateful things that she was yelling at Miss Giddens about the whole thing. And I didn't actually catch anything that Flora had said, but I do catch Miles when it happens to him later on. But I didn't, I didn't actually catch anything that, you know, Flora actually said. Uh, I do her shrieking though. Wow. That was something else. Good set of lungs on that girl. Uh, Miss Giddens decides that Mrs. Gross is going to take Flora to her uncles in London, everyone else is going to leave the house and it's just going to be her and miles. And she's going to finally just confront miles, just flat out, have it out with him. And so Mrs. Gross is like, okay. And there's a scene where Mrs. Gross and Flora are in the carriage. And it's that shot you were talking about where Flora is in the foreground. She's like, she's like right here. And then Miss Giddens is way back here. And Flora is staring straight ahead. Won't even look at her. Hates the woman now. And so they leave. And you have just Miles and Miss Giddens. And Miss and Miles' first is just like, this is great. Oh, we're going to have tea in this room? How grown up. And don't worry I'll protect you. I'm the man of the house. (laughs) Right. Again, fully embracing this whole adult level that he just really doesn't have. You know what I mean? And he's acting very childlike, but after all the other stuff, it makes it even creepier that he's acting normal. Um, she eventually, you know, just because this like takes it like 10 minutes just to kind of wrap it up. She gets him to the point where she's like, Just say it. Say his name. You're the, he's here. He's controlling you. And he just spouts off all kinds of nasty stuff about her. And then he's laughing at her. He's being mean. And in the reflection behind him, you see Quint and it's Quint's face. So from Miss Giddens standpoint, he is the one who's driving this whole thing. Quint is just controlling the boy and making the boy say these horrible things. And she keeps forcing him to see this ghost that he claims he can't see. And he claims he can't see. And he stops and he looks up and then he collapses. And you're like, oh, it worked. (laughs) Kudos. Way to go. She goes over and picks him up and she's like, it's all going to be okay, Miles. It's all going to be okay. And then they have a camera come in and look at Miles again. And his eyes are open. He is not okay. Miles is dead. So in 1961, you have this full-on mouth kiss. Then we've killed a child. 
And then after she's holding the dead body of this child, she reciprocates that full-on mouth kiss. And I was just like, I see why this was a very disturbing (laughs) film in 1961. Yeah, yeah. It's still disturbing. It was interesting to me that they chose to do it like that because in the book, if memory serves me correctly, Flora is there when this happens to Miles. Because Flora says, is he going to be all right? Okay. And Miss Giddens is like, everything's going to be fine now. You know, and that was kind of like the end of the book. And you're like, wow, I don't even know what that means. Right. Um, so it was really odd to me that they removed Flora from the picture. Just because I thought, you know, I thought that was a nice thing having her there. But interestingly enough, when they shot this, Clayton was really big on not scaring the kids. The kids would not get their script sheets. I mean, they'd get the lines and things, but they wouldn't get them until just before they were actually going to go on to do it, which says something for the kids as actors. Yeah. So like Miles, the the guy who played Miles, let me see, Martin Stevens, when he, the day before when they closed shooting, had no idea his character was going to die the next day. And he said it was because, one, he wanted the kids to actually just run around and have a good time. And two, he didn't want to do anything that would leave any lasting impressions on the kids, you know, as they grew up. So um, I just I I thought that was fascinating was like, I'm not even going to I'm not even going to tell you what's going to happen to you. It it was reminiscent of like uh, Infinity War. Now, if you ever hear him talking to the guy who played Spider-Man, he's like, (laughs) I wouldn't even know what was going on because they're so afraid I would say stuff. So (laughs) that's his own fault. (laughs) Yeah. But it it was reminiscent of that where it's like, we're not even going to tell you what's going to happen. You just show up and we'll go from there. Right. What, one other thing I I have on my notes to point out when she's going over to get um, Flora from the Island, that's when a huge storm breaks out. And that's very symbolic, uh, especially in movies of, you know, when things are crazy, yeah. uh, you know, that her, her psyche broke and it brought the fool on storm and it's a storm right there yeah. for a short amount of time. And, you know, not to be all literary about it, but it is literary, literary horror film. In my opinion, Shakespeare did the same thing. You know, you look at like when all the action happens in Macbeth, it's like, there's a storm out, you know, right. brewing. And, and so it's a good way to like, in the environment even feels the tension and is throwing in on it. So, right. Yeah. Good, good movie. Yeah. Uh, like I said, and it's one of those nice ones because it's historically important. If you're into horror movies, um, this is definitely one you should watch, but not only that, it's one you'll enjoy watching. Yeah. It actually opposed to some other horror, you know, (laughs) Blair witch project is a historically important film, right? But if you're not seeing it for the first time, it's kind of a miserable watch. And the more times you watch it, the worse it gets. Yeah. Right. But the first time you see it, you're like, wow, that really, really worked. And it's historically important because it's the first time that like that kind of thing did so well. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been thinking about while we've been talking, you said there's not a lot of American films on here. And I think the reason is nothing against American film culture, but you had asked for films that most people haven't seen. Yes. And a lot of the movies we've talked about have had really or no release in the United States, which is a great way for it to be guaranteed as something you've never seen. Yeah, very much so. You know, it'd be interesting to release all the podcast episodes if anyone that does happen to listen or watch if you know comment oh yeah i saw this movie in my country or i saw this in the theater or something like that i'd be interested to find out yeah that that would be awesome um i can't even imagine like you know going to see martyrs in a theater yeah what would that be like first date yeah well (laughs) and last yeah i was gonna say that's the end (laughs) of that one (laughs) yeah uh you, you gotta watch but uh you know The Innocence, for as much as people love it, a really small release. I mean, it released in England, 
and I, you know, 1961, it was a lot harder to release movies back then because you had great big things of film and, you know, right. um, but so it's not that it's unheard of because it's a very well-known film. And as you pointed out, you can find it in a lot of places, right? But like even in 1965, if you were a film critic in the United States, there's a really good chance you never saw this movie because getting a hold of it would be really, really Back difficult. Yeah. 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 It was a good one. Definitely recommend it. I, I mean, for compared to most of the other ones we've watched, this one is uh, more of your standard. Let's rent a movie <laughs> movie. Uh, the other ones haven't been so much. No, uh, you know, I, I think of the other ones we've watched Byzantium is probably the closest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause it felt like, you know, the kind of movie you might actually see in a theater. Yeah. Um, Though I think, you know, probably for American taste, that would have been a very slow movie to watch in a theater. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, um, I, none of this is complaint. I, that it's exactly what we wanted to do. Right. You know, everybody has seen interview with the vampire and stuff like that. Yeah. Queen you know? of the damned, that kind of deal. Yeah. We want something different. That's, that was our goal. Right. And, um, we're going to end up with different and it's really odd to me. Like, the first couple movies, we had the whole dynamic where you have the the um, one buddy who's taking responsibility for everything, and then the one buddy who's like more idealistic, and you know. Um, so here, this movie and then the next one are very similar in the same kind of tone about you know there's horrible things happening. Is it supernatural or is someone just off their rocker kind of deal? Right. And they they both, you know, for different reasons, are technical masterpieces. Uh, you know, this one with the whole everything was done by hand and all the detail. And then for the next one, for completely different things, we'll talk about next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The next <laughs> one, yeah, we had some totally different discussion for that one. Yes. La Casa Muda. La Casa Muda. I, one of the other things that I think is really interesting is as we look through these – how many of these movies have been remade? Yes. For a larger audience. Yes. Martyrs was remade in the States. The Innocence has been redone 8 million times. And La Casa Muda was recently redone as the silent house with um, Scarlet Witch. Scarlet Witch. Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting too, because I, I mean, I, I would just, I'm guessing here, just knowing how things go in the past, that if we would watch the original and then the remake, we would probably hate the remake way more. Us yep. personally, yep. you know, uh, I mean, when I saw the silent house with Elizabeth Olsen, I didn't watch it, but I saw the poster and the preview and I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's the, 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 you know, same movie here. And I'm like, that doesn't look as good. <laughs> it's, it's really funny because nine times out of 10, you're absolutely correct. I think the only exception that I can come up with off the top of my head is the ring. Okay. Which is an American made film was a remake of a Japanese film called Ringu. Right. And of the two, I like the ring better. Okay. But it's like one of the only ones that I can think of that is like, uh, Zhuan and the grudge. They're pretty comparable as yeah, far yeah, as they're, they're almost scene for scene. <laughs> right. And, and like quality wise, the whole thing has the same feel, you know, it's, I, I appreciate them both equally. I actually like the ring better than I liked Ringu, okay. um, which is just a really rare thing. Cause nine times out of 10, what you said was right. The remake is just, Hey, the, this looks like a great thing. We could probably make some money off this. Right. And I think we're both of the same camp. It's not the big budget Hollywood special effects and slick production that will draw us into these movies. Right. It, it, it can be a, the great story. It can be the great, some other, you know, like the battery just, him doing it with a low budget and some of the scenes, the way he shot them. Uh, that's what makes it such a great movie. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to we had a $50 million budget and we spent six months filming, you know, it doesn't mean it's going to be good comparatively. Right. So, and we've always had that B movies, you know, there's a thing for those. Absolutely. So, you know, what we really need to do is find one of these movies to sit down and talk about. And get Bruce Campbell on here to talk to us with it. <laughs> wow, I'd really have to specially pick one just for him. 
we should find one and just send the word out because uh, there's a thing going on that went on this summer. LeVar Burton was at, and I almost went to it and I was uh, on my geek podcast with Alan. I was like, we need to start a campaign to get us to talk to LeVar Burton on our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, now we need to start a campaign to get Bruce Campbell on our podcast to talk to us. Sure. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah. So yeah, what's he been doing lately? Anyway, his prime show is done or whatever. Isn't it? Being famous. Yeah, yeah, he goes to all the cons and stuff, I'm sure. Yep. So, all right, man. The creature slips from perception. Pay attention. 